Good afternoon, everybody. This is Peter. This is our July 15th biweekly radio address. I hope everyone's doing well. I'm a bit flustered today, so excuse me if I uh, if I ramble on or if I do something strange. There's been so much going on. I um, am preparing for this London lecture, and the material for that has been coming very well, but it's been it's been just very arduous to get an entirely new presentation with new developments happening. I hope everyone got the email about that. That event is now officially full, uh, so that should be very good, but we are working to make sure there's no conflicts or problems when we have it live, have the live stream occur on Ustream. As many might remember, the Z-Day event was uh, cut short for some reason. They cut off thousands of people for no reason, and naturally it's difficult to afford the bandwidth necessary to have a highly independent, you know, commercial stream. We really can't afford that. So hopefully this will work out well, and of course this can be taped from many different angles and will be will be online uh, shortly after. Also, the email that was sent out denoted that there was a Sunday event in London on the 26th. That event actually I can't make that anymore, so that's that's canceled. That was at the Secret Garden party, so it's only the 25th event now. So in case any of you were planning on going to the 26th event, I will not be there. So keep that in mind. I'll try to send out another email about that as well. But uh, that's about it. I've just been very busy. I um, I want to get more in, in uh, tune with the chapters which have been developing. The U.S. state chapters have been doing a lot of work, and uh, they're going to be posted soon. Uh, this is where the lecture circuit is going to come into play very specifically. Obviously, if you're international, it's it's a it's a different walk. But in the states, we're going to start making webs through universities with the lecture circuits that we develop, and that's going to be basically the medium of that. It should be it should be very effective. It should work. I have some institutions that I'm trying to bring in, and uh, once we get people that are representative of this in a in a clear way, in other words, that can speak clearly and express the information. And I know there's a lot of you out there, and I apologize again for the delays and all of this, but uh, that's that is a very important thing, and we're going to have that happening very soon. The issue uh, today is going to be straight through your questions again. Um, there's some other points that I'm going to wait to bring up when I get more clarity for them. But uh, overall, I've just uh, been crazy with this new lecture, and I've finally got a chance to go through all these questions, at least most of them, in review. So let's go through these. There's a lot of good questions here. There's, of course, a lot of re repetitious points that have been addressed before, but it's good because they come at it from different angles. And I think for a lot of people, you can tell them something in one sense in one perspective and they understand it only in that perspective and they have yet to be able to apply that understanding more universally to other points. Um, in other words, the same questions asked over and over again in many different ways and that's actually a good thing and I hope that uh, with the knowledge base that we're going to be creating very soon which will basically have all of this information in it, uh, it will hopefully just be a massive amount of information that people can search and it will be very helpful. So that's, uh, that's in the works. As you might imagine, my time has been running very short. If you've been emailing me, just be patient. I'll, I'll get back to you. I know the chapters um, have been on the sidelines, but uh, it's just it's been difficult time-wise. So I hope you guys understand that, and I'm sure most of you do. All right, question one. An individual's need for structure might explain why many gravitate towards religious groups or unnecessary nine-to-five jobs. In the society proposed by the Zenus Project, what type of factors will contribute to a sense of community, structure, and meaning on the behalf of the individual? Well, that's a very interesting question. I, um, I would have to first point out that meaning and structure and community do not necessarily have anything to do with nine to five jobs, even though there might be a social element there. I would say that those are actually very demeaning in those regard, in that regard, excuse me. Uh, religious groups, of course, tend to be very social, and there's certainly an element of community there. And I think um, I think a lot of people, when they go to church on Sunday, they do it in more of a social sense. It isn't necessarily for uh, religious reasons. Religious reasons always. There's an old George Carlin quote that people go to church to compare clothing. I've always thought that was amusing. There's a interesting in my experience of going to church. There's always a bizarre degree of vanity, uh, but regardless, that's not the question. So let me actually focus on your question. I think the things that will contribute to a sense of community in a resource-based economy will be that, first of all, it's based on cooperation, not competition. So that type of parasitic cutthroat mentality won't 
won't be as uh, prevalent and it won't be as much of a threat. People won't be as afraid of each other. And I think there'll be a dramatic shift in the way people look at each other in this type of system. There'll also be a lot more free time. People won't be strapped in all sorts of ways from debt. You know, at this stage, both parents tend to work in almost every family, certainly in America. And that wasn't always the case. And, you know, these old these old uh, ideas from years and years ago that somehow we'd have more free time, you know, Thorsten Veblen, the theory of the leisure class, there's a great logical basis to all of this, but something's happened and none of this has come to fruition. And I think the reason is, is because of the way the economic structure, in fact, I know the reason is, is because of the way the economic structure is actually created. There's, there's no pressure release valve in this system. And that's really why people pop so quickly, so frequently in our society. Someone wants asked me about people that, you know, have high stress levels and, you know, post office employees that freak out and start shooting people. And they ask, you know, about the causes of that. And I, I, I made a number of different points, but one thing that <laughs> hit me in the, the uh, moment of thinking about that was I just can't believe there isn't more of that happening. I'm actually amazed at how well society has actually dealt with the pressures that are pushed upon them artificially in this culture. I'm not surprised ever when I see someone who walks into a church and just blows people away or someone who walks into a post office or kids who walk into a school. Uh, that's just another clarification that there's far too much stress in the system and that stress is artificial and coming from so many different angles. That's another that's a very interesting point, stress. Think about that as far as the what our social structure actually is. So in the Venus Project Society the family would be restored in the sense that you know, there would be time to actually nurture each other. And I think that's that's powerful. Also, culture will flourish in a way where it deviates from a lot of the escape routes that are used today. Uh, in New York City, where I live, if you are going out on the weekend, everyone goes to a bar, and there's just these overflowing uh, bars and intoxication. There's a, I believe it's a rejection of all of the servitude that's been pushed during the week, and people have this explosive need to get out and to basically get intoxicated as a form of escape, I think things like that will diminish dramatically, and you'll have people doing things that are culturally interesting, literally interesting, not just um, you know hanging out in a watering hole. Um, you know, rather than arbitrary respect for money and property, the new values will come from personal and social accomplishment. So that that's really the clincher, as far as I'm concerned. This system. Individual meaning in this system is based upon how much status you have, which is, of course, based upon your socioeconomic status almost universally. So that will no longer exist. There will be a reason why people are respected, and it will have to do with their own personal integrity, which will often be attributed to what they've contributed to society. It's one thing to be self to be self motivated and to understand uh, have discipline, in other words to understand yourself very well. And it's another thing to apply that discipline and understanding to society and engage the world around you. Uh, I hope that makes sense. So it, the sense of value and personal accomplishment is really twofold. It's your own personal value of understanding yourself, and it's also how you relate to your environment and what you do to contribute to that environment, which is actually the contribution to yourself. I think it was an old Mar Margaret Mead quote that said that the most meaningful things that people tend to re reflect on or what they've done to contribute to others and to help others, and I think that really holds true. Uh, this culture is far too superficial, and it creates a demeaning mentality. I think a lot of people out there really don't even like themselves uh, because of what they've been forced to do and the way that their behavior is culminated. And I think that explains a lot of the, the neuroses that people feel in the great fields of depression. Um, anyway, number two, Peter, do you think the U.S. has any role in the destabilization of Iran? Do you believe that the U.S. will exploit the current state of affairs and use it as an excuse to make advancements into Iran? I assume you're referring to the election uprising that happened a little while back. Um, I'm actually not even sure what the status of that is now. Uh, usually stuff like that comes out long after the fact. When you, fit, when you hear about uh, CIA involvement, you, it slowly comes out. So there's a whistleblower or some document is finally released. And uh, I really don't know. I certainly would say that there's a genuine interest for the U.S. to exploit any political shift, especially in those countries that they find to be um, offensive or a threat in some way, or that they have a geopolitical interest in. So uh, regardless, the exploitation is always going to be there, and it will definitely be, quote, capitalized on, no pun intended, uh, whenever possible. 
but I don't really don't know. We'll know in hindsight. And I, in the end, it, nothing seemed to really uh, transpire there, best on what, best, based on what I can tell, as far as dramatic change. Uh, number three, what you advocate is a global system. Can a test site ever really come about, considering the wide variety of resources needed to run a society, and generally are not located all in one place? Do you feel that since we will shed much of the nonsense and impractical aspects of society, we will be able to get by on more minimal but still approach, but still favorable approach in the beginning, a more minimal, yeah, a, that should be a more minimal but still approachable, still favorable approach in the beginning. I hope I made that relatively clear. There's actually two questions here. First, uh, can a test site ever really come about because of the resources needed? This has been pointed out a few times. It's a great point. Uh, one of the most profound reasons the um, the concept of the state as we know it is detrimental is that global organization is of fundamental importance because resources that are needed to fuel social development are all over the place. And that's really the issue. You can't have all of these corporations and states hoarding resources. Obviously, that's is where trade comes into play, but trade is heavily manipulated. And this is one of the reasons the world is what it is today. So the fact of the matter is, is that you can't have a communal aspect with these first cities. A global system in the end is extremely important and sort of has to happen simultaneously as, conf as difficult as that might be to, uh, to consider. So the test site is more of an example site and it, resources will naturally have to be brought in. But uh, you're absolutely correct in, in what you're stating. This is why we have to make sure that we begin this movement on a global level initially and not just approach it as a communal type of environment because it can't really work that way. And the other question is, do you feel uh, it will shed a lot of the nonsense and practical aspects of society uh, and be more minimal in the initial stages? Well, I, I can see how that might be relevant, but, I hopefully, but hopefully that isn't the case. Hopefully that won't have to be the case. We're dealing with technology used at its highest level. Rather than minimalism, I think in certain areas, depending on how the transition works, what you point out might be relevant. But uh, I hope not. And I, again, this is just an extremely difficult question about what the future of the transition might be. And I really don't know the answer to that. But uh, I hope you see the logic that we really need to get the world behind this as a whole for it to come off the ground, as dramatic as that is. Number four. Would there still be a place for human-based organizations of authority? For example, there are health professionals today, such as dentists, chiropractors, doctors, etc., which have licensing regulatory bodies that maintain certain standards of practice. This is done for the benefit of the safety of society. Um, if such a thing were needed in a resource-based economy, and I think there would be, he says, would this not mean that laws and direct social regulation are still a reality? Would it not be... Would it not be going too far to say that all laws would disappear, he says, question? Okay, well, first, the use of the ideas of authority, your use of the ideas of authority and law are really not applicable here, for there is no lure in a resource-based economy of profit to generate dishonesty for a medical service. The second point would be, as technology continues to replace people in the medical community, the doctors will still express their... Their, ex their expertise ex and experience to patients by the, quote, credentials or educational route they have taken. Obviously, if someone wants to go to a specialist that's in existence, they want to know something about them. Obviously, in this world, we have credentials, and those credentials show us that someone completed a certain degree of education. Education, of course, exists in a powerful form in a resource-based economy, and if we have to use credentialism on some level, it's which is just a, not credentialism in the in the derogatory way it's used now. I, I can't stand credentialist logic and the the way you defer people that don't have credentials. It's a very it's a very difficult thing to deal with, as Jacques has pointed out, who has no quote credentials. It's been very difficult him for him in his life to get somewhere because people value him not on what he says, but his credentials, and unfortunately that's the case. But when it comes to, obviously, medical stuff, you want to go to somebody who knows what they're doing. How do you know what they're doing? You look at their experience, and, you, and this could easily be tracked. So, um, let's see. The third point, I think, would be um, people with annotated skills will, of course, exist, but um, actually, yes. The people with annotated skills will, of course, exist, 
that they will be public known, which is a reiteration of what I just said. Sorry, I was reading the note here. A uh, real issue is that there's no motivation for corruption, so the information can be out there and people can learn about it. I think laws are not needed to regulate it because it's one person's decision to go to this person or another. And if someone is not doing well in their practice, it should be readily transparent uh, based on their information, based on the information that's available about them. So there's no need to regulate them because there's no reason for manipulation. And it's up to the individual to use their judgment to decide where to go. And granted, that might sound risky to some people out there, but the educational system, I think, would be enough where where it would become very transparent who was good at something and who wasn't. And for someone to even be in the field without the exchange of money, they would obviously have a genuine interest in it. And that's a profound point. I'd rather be with, go to somebody that's doing it because they like something rather than because they're getting paid to do it. I think that's, that's pretty much universally true. Number five. <clears throat> I have difficulty understanding the problems of today as Fresco states being technical. The concept of a resource-based economy did not come from a technically advanced society, but rather a poor behind island. So how can our problems be technical if they were solved previously without much technology? That's a great question. Yes, but only by ignoring modern invention and convention and tools and convenience. There, there's really no turning back at this point. The technical problems of the past um, consisted of a reduced state of functionality and operation. Uh, think about how dramatic it was when electricity was finally being put in every home. All the problems that had existed, such as keeping food cold, was now replaced by machines that could be powered by electricity, a refrigerator, that resolved the problem of food spoiling so quickly because of the difficulty of keeping ice in those early uh, ice boxes that were used. There is naturally a – every time new stuff of that – new technological advancements occur, you're always going to have new problems occur. But this is just the path that has been created. Technology is incredible now. We can – instead of me having to travel distances of thousands, million, thousands of miles to talk to somebody in India, now I can go on the Internet and communicate with them. Are there problems built into that? Yes, there are. But it's amazing. So why are we – we shouldn't think about it as far as um, turning back. There have been dramatic problems that people aren't even aware of. Some people don't know what the problems of society today even are, and that's one of the biggest things that I like about Jacques is he actually understands what the problems are. Most people see surface problems. So the public has to understand what the problems are, and if you were living back in the day, you probably wouldn't even think about – you having to travel long distances to bring a telegram to somebody as a problem. That was simply, quote, just the way it was. You didn't have the emotional interest of it being a problem. So as we learn more, we begin to identify other problems. We can base them on inferential logic derived from prior systems. And we can see that we have a lot of problems today that we could resolve. For example, maybe in the future, something can happen where we can put ourselves in another place without actually being there through various forms of holographic imagery or what have you in real time, sort of like being inside of a television. I'm speaking very theoretically. Uh, let, let's jump even more dramatically to the Star Trek idea of beaming yourself to other places. Maybe variations like that could occur. As of right now, is it a problem that we have to jump on a plane and go somewhere? Frankly, with the, uh, the understanding that we have maglev technology that can go extremely fast, I see getting on a plane as a problem now. Why? Because it's not fast and efficient enough as it should be. I see getting on a plane that spits out all of the atmospheric issues from the fossil fuels that are burned as a problem because it's damaging the environment when I know that we can create transportation that does not do that, that's even more efficient. So the problems emerge the more you're aware of them. Well, obviously that was a redundant statement. The problems emerge the more you begin to understand what the consequences are. I hope that makes sense. So yes, uh, you know, unless we want to go back to hunters and gatherers, um, we're going to have to keep moving forward and resolve the problems as they develop. And uh, that's why everything is technical, because all problems are actually technical ultimately. Because politics doesn't do anything, really. It's a matter of budgets in politics and control of the population to maintain the establishment. Technical problems justify just about everything you can think of. Even emotional problems 
as they've been analyzed, come from environmental conditions, and they come from biological problems, biological hormonal conditions, and they're still technical in nature once you break them down. It's a difficult train of thought when you get on that level, but I, I see no reason why it doesn't hold true. There's a cause and effect reality, and therefore it's technical. Number six. I would like to know your opinion as to what the most relevant and immediate issues are concerning the transition. That is to say, as I understand, the primary focus of the Zeitgeist movement currently is communications. What are the first steps being taken organizationally that will begin transition actions? Well, I think I've covered this a few times. The first step, of course, is mass awareness and, uh, to put it gesturally, social therapy. We do it through the web. We do it through print film, lectures, art, anything. I think uh, the concept of social therapy is a powerful one. It's almost as though um, it's an educational process to show people what the possibilities are simultaneously with the amount of corruption that exists and to show them that there are resolutions to the corruption and it isn't just an us against them thing and all that stuff that's perpetuated by about 99% of the people out there. Most people out there are there to tell you that this group this organization, this policy is the problem. They don't realize that the majority of our problems stem from root, a root cause, and that cause is the general organization of society as a whole, specifically through the socioeconomic system. So that's really what our first step is. It's education. That's why I get frustrated with people that keep telling me they want to build a city. You can build a city all you want. If the people don't understand how to live there, then it's not going to do anything. Granted, I think there can be steps that move incrementally. Uh, say, for example, you move, you finally get the persuasion for all of the airline companies to shut down and move into maglev technology. We'll say in a market system. If that could happen, wow, that would be profound. But do you really think it will? Do you really think that they're going to drop their establishment and all of the incredible problems that would arise? because of um, the loss of profit, the loss of jobs. It's a powerful transition. It's a brick wall that a, that a establishment like that has to walk through in order to change everything because of the money that's related and all the ramifications of that. So that would be an idealistic step, but um, ultimately I think uh, it's going to be mass awareness. You know, once large pockets of participation occur in nearly every country, um, Steps towards political and corporate influence will be made. This can be made in many different ways. Uh, if you want me to be completely candid, if you had, say, if you had, say, 500 million people simultaneously protest across the world and not do anything that's related to the general operation of society, you would see some extremely large number. You'd see an extremely large number of heads turn as to see the power of the masses for transformation. Unfortunately, it does take those types of numbers. So, there's lots of ideas that I've thought about, but it's going to take numbers before any of that can happen. Number seven: Will the Venus Project happen in our lifetime? That's up to you. Will there's three parts to this question? What will approximately? When will? When will approximately your next movie come out? Uh, 2010, idealistically October, but I want to have it out sooner. Um, as long as I can kind of silence some of the uh, administrative stuff that I'm trapped in right now, I'm hoping to have it out sooner, but we'll, we'll see. Uh, that film is going to verify a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about in a concrete fashion. Um, I see this film as really the beginning. Uh, Third part of the question, will sports exist in the Venus Project or will there just be exercise? Sports will transform into personal betterment, not the us-against-them competition. Uh, what's a good example of this? Well, I think Jock's example is profound where he talks about a tennis player who goes and he plays against a virtual image of himself in a technological slash acoustic, if you will, environment. So you have a tennis ball that's coming at you, say it's against the wall, that's designed where it can instantly know and project the ball's angle and instantly angle that ball back at you like a professional tennis player might do. And, and through time, it could actually mimic your exact performance as it evaluates you as you play. So you're competing against yourself. 
And that's really what the whole competition should be. Take the game of pool. Pool is an interesting game because it's not the same type of competitive, real-time competition that you tend to find in the world today. It's not like tennis. It's not like um, it's not like football. It's not like soccer. Pool, when your opponent shoots a shot, all the balls stop. And in the end, in the analysis of it, it doesn't matter what your opponent thinks or does per se, because you have no control over that. Only in preparation for their shot do you have control if you were to play something like defense. But all the cards are on the table openly and in a stable state, meaning that even if your opponent didn't exist, it wouldn't matter. So your game of pool is really contingent upon yourself. And it actually doesn't even matter if you win or, win or, win or lose. It's contingent upon the quality of the shots that you make. And you can analyze yourself as you do it. Uh, it's, it's bizarre to me. Uh, if you want to know the, a great tip, and I'm throwing this out there to make a point, of how to approach, say, the game of pool in a competitive environment, I say this to make the point that competition is meaningless. It's meaningless in the sense that it doesn't do anything to even feel that, that type of push. Is if you inst- just ignore your opponent entirely and pretend they're not there and shoot every shot on an isolated basis, you'll have a much less emotional response and you'll perform most likely in a, in a much higher degree. When I was a kid, my father taught me to play pool. He was, he's a very good pool player. and I reached my peak of pool performance at about 12 years old, and I would go and play in tournaments against people that were 40, 50, and 60, and I was amazed at how angry they would be, these 50, 60-year-old guys. They'd get so irate by being beaten in a tournament by a 12-year-old kid. And it was amazing just to see how irrational and idiotic the whole thing was. Immature, childish, silly. And unfortunately, that is the summary of most competitive sports as we see today. Competition in sports is one of the most profitable games there is. It, we pay these, these athletes more money than we pay any scientists. So naturally, they're going to gravitate towards heavy political sponsorship, excuse me, heavy promotional sponsorship, and all the things that are relevant to keep the crowd in that state of mind of competition. It's a, it's a colossal distortion. Um, it's, uh, I think I'm rambling a little bit too much on this one, but uh, there really is no such thing as competition against someone else. It's only competition against yourself, and that's not competition, that's improvement. If you have to value yourself by comparing yourself to what others are doing, you're suffering from a dramatic form of neuroses. Number eight. How can I raise my children in today's society with morals and values that assimilate with the Venus Project? Well, that's a, that's a huge question. I, I wish I had the aptitude, aptitude to, do, to defend that, excuse me, to, uh, to relate that question. Uh, this is more of a Jacques question. They're not on today. I can try to make a note to ask Jacques that question. I think he might have been asked, actually, in the past. Uh, what I will say is that from my scientific research, uh, early life experience is extremely critical. If you, um, there was a study done many, many years ago by a king, I think it was in the 13th century, and it was very bizarre. It was one of those forbidden experiments that happened uh, kind of behind the scenes, from what I understand. And the king wanted to know what the, quote, natural language of the human being was. So what he did is he took a bunch of infants, and he put them in individual rooms, separated from each other, of course, and separated basically from people, very young, never learned to speak yet, uh, very little exposure to, to well, zero exposure to language, from what I understand. Uh, the source I had wasn't extremely specific on the exact terms of the experiment, but nevertheless, there was no exposure to language. The people that that helped the children would go in, give them nice clothes, and a nice bed. It was This was a king, so it was an extremely lush environment, give them the best food, but no one would say a word, and they wouldn't play with them or communicate in any, in any meaningful way. So when they did this experiment, they wanted to see what would happen as far as language. Guess what? All the kids died. The kids died because evidently there's a component to the human being that requires some form of affection and touch. And this has been proven in mice. This has been proven in non-human primates. If you don't touch a child, uh, they will, their growth will stifle, and they will develop lots of stress responses that can h- inhibit them for the rest of their life. Uh, this is a little besides your point, but I think it's important to realize the science that's emerged in this way. And you know what's funny to me, or not funny, but you know what's relevant to me, is that in the world today, we have this religious notion that every person should be allowed to reproduce as much as possible with no regard for the caring capacity of the earth, and no regard for any type of uh, you know educational scheme or conditioning scheme, or anything that would you know naturally be relevant to to the upbringing of an individual. And 
given this given this reality that the science has shown that there are some extremely important things that parents should do almost universally to give kids a healthy immune system, a healthy physiology to help their growth. Uh, this information is not out there, and I find it profoundly sick that that this information isn't made publicly available. You know, the sickest thing, actually, is that most people would react to such, say, uh, you know, such suggestions as being an attempt to control their freedom of parenting or something to that effect. We are bio biosocial machines, and it's time we accept that. There was another study that was done with, with pre-mature kids in incubators, and they had kids in incubators on one side that just sat there for long periods of time. Then they had other ones that were touched readily by nurses as an experimental study, and those kids that were touched grew 50% faster. And they also had a stro stronger immuno, Im excuse me, stronger immune system in time as the kids that were not touched as they tracked it. So I'm throwing that out there just because I think it's a very important uh, scientific reality that people should be aware of. Um, that's just one of many, many issues. Uh, childhood development, of course, is, is extremely critical for the rest of your life. But um, if I was to say anything else to this question, I would say that you should never compare a child, compare a child to another. So that's just going to set up a spiral of envy and competition. This is one of the grave mistakes I think parents do. Is they, want, they think it's positive to have their kid be envious of others. They think it's motivating, which it is only to a certain extent, but it's compromised by the degree of neuroses that's also generated and spite that's also generated. I would also say that you should encourage kids to have an interest in science and nature and natural phenomenon rather than corporate branded cartoons or, or fantasies or uh, things that don't have a tangible relationship to anything. Uh, granted, that's, that's a considerably subjective statement, but you can find your own medium in that. I think the arts and sciences are probably the healthiest thing that uh, you can involve a child into. Uh, art basically is science as far as I'm concerned. Number nine. Is it possible to sustain people with only the resources of their immediate environment? Would global trade still be necessary? That's an interesting question. I think you might have been missing some of the preliminary statements, preliminary points that have been made in the activist orientation guide. Um, obviously, and this goes back to the prior question, no, you can't just sustain a people, at least in most probability on the largest scale, you can't sustain a people just by the resources in their immediate environment. You can in a very primitive way. That's, of course, possible. But global trade is not necessary. I mean, in the end, no modern society, um, in the end, a modern society requires minerals and other resources from all over the world. And as far as global trade, it's not by definition. It's global access. That's the term. Trade is, trade is based on a financial construct, based on scarcity. Uh, with, with the system we intend to devise, it's based on global access, and that's one of the biggest um, points to be made. So if somebody needs something, the systems are set up, the infrastructure is set up where it's made available to them, and, and that's that. And if there's a problem with shortages and things like that, they're immediately addressed and foreshadowed by the longest time um, in, the, in the most efficient way they possibly can be. So if you have an iron ore in a specific region of Africa, that has multiple distribution routes going all over the world, and they suddenly discover that, that particular source of iron ore is limited, the, the tentacles of the nervous system, so to speak, of the global cyberdata complex will immediately evaluate where the other sources of iron ore are, if they exist. If they don't exist, then instantly the computations are made to decide what the substitution would be. And it's mathematically permeated, because it's known, of mathematically permeated where everything that society is producing with iron ore are assessed and reduced and optimized to the effect where it's a, it's a homogeneous awareness of everything that iron ore is going in and therefore and it's only it's a technical process too a computer could do it in a matter of seconds knowing substitutions knowing how to readjust supply knowing how to make adaptations for whole elements that might not uh, excuse me for whole products that might not be that might not be applicable as another product. This is, I'm sorry to be sounding convoluted on this. It's a very difficult train of thought. I'm trying to relay it in a way that uh, that covers as many variables as possible. But very simply, you will have substitutions that are that will be made instantly. Not to mention an immediate awareness and immediate seeking of that resource anywhere else on the planet. 
I hope that summarizes that. That's a uh, that's really a topic for a massive schematic that could be created to show show how that would work. But it's global access to resources, not trade. Number ten. Do you expect the big pro enterprise influences will react once the? Excuse me. How do you expect the big pro enterprise influences to react once the transition plan is in place? For instance, the politicians of various countries, big businesses, CEOs, and the like, they will probably react very negatively to, uh, to this new system. And when the majority of people decide to put this updated plan into action, how do you think these people will, who have exploited the system on the most extreme scale will adjust to the new system and live a more peaceful and meaningful life? Uh, there's many different attributes to that statement. As far as the, the basic question where you're denoting how are we going to deal with those that have done very well in the system, that are at the upper echelons, that have all the resources, that have all the money. Well, once it's understood by the public that the system is welcomed with the technicals tested and the initial site set up, the, the people at the top of the social hierarchy are going to be under a great amount of pressure. And I think that they will eventually be embarrassed by their selfishness and simply falter. It's not that they will be, if not, then most likely they will be protested out of operation. I, that would be the other extreme. I really don't know, but we know that the minority, the elite, are, again, a very small group of people, and they really don't stand a chance, regardless of how many resources they have, against the majority of the population, which, of course, as we know, is abused. So they've set this up themselves, so to speak. The reason the police are what they are is to protect, protect those rich elite and the status quo. Even the police and the military don't have enough numbers to stand up against the population as a whole if it chose to move in a unified direction. So those are extreme statements, but I think they're important to make, and I think uh, fundamentally um, they answer that question. Number 11. What do you think of a backup communications network set up over shortwave amateur radio, possibly just voice communications between chapters or perhaps an actual channel that can be listened to globally or eventually a complete backup to the current Internet sites with bulletin boards? Well, I think that those are fantastic ideas. I, hopefully we won't get to that point. I, I'm, I'm fairly positive that we're going to have freedom of the Internet in this country for a good deal longer unless some kind of bizarre cataclysmic event happens where they take it upon themselves to convince the public that, uh, that somehow they need, some reason they need to restrict it. Obviously, terrorism would be the, the first excuse used. So I, I agree with you. Um, I will keep that in mind in case something, something goes down. But, um, you know, I don't think we need that type of redundancy at this level. I think uh, there's, the Internet's here, for, here to stay, best on what I can tell, and restrictions I think are not going to be tolerated by the general public. Obviously, we already have problems in other countries. Um, if this stuff begins to uh, to occur, then we'll we'll make that type of move. Good idea, though. Number twelve. How exactly will the Venus Project get their script turned into a Hollywood film? Besides waiting for this movement to get so big that filmmakers will learn about it and make the film. Well, if I had the script now, I could take it to a few people I have connections to in Hollywood. It isn't as much about the movement, really, as the idea itself. The movement in the eyes of a Hollywood producer would simply mean numbers and possible profit and interest. The idea itself, however, I think is, is beautifully laid out because the visual aspects of Jacques' work are already, are already there. So all of the cognitive work that would be necessary, all the creative work that would be needed to create a futuristic film has, already has the blueprints there because it's of Jacques' extremely interesting looking streamlined visual images. Um, you know, I think I think that's a big plus. So I don't think it's contingent upon the movement to ask your question. I think it's contingent upon getting a solid script and getting a nice package together um, and showing it to somebody with influence and, and, and going from there. Number 13, I have two questions. One, is there work on adding subtitles to the video orientation orientation DVD? Uh, yes, the dot sub video that's on the homepage has a link. Well, actually, the whole thing, the dot sub implementation is basically a site that is designed for people to create subtitles. So it's actually quite easy. The text is there and you I believe they have a program. I've never actually done it, but you can you can add subtitles instantly. And there's about I don't know, I think there's there's a dozen, maybe two dozen subtitles that are already in functionality. Excuse me, already in in uh, already being created there. I apologize for my 
my random words today. Um, but yes, that's there. Number two, what should we say to people who insist that the movement is based on conspiracy theories and that it may have a hidden agenda? I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. As far as it being based on conspiracy, conspiracy theories, I, I assume you mean in a derogatory way, or, or do you mean that, that it is a conspiracy theory and we have a hidden agenda? I will assume the uh, former. First, you explain that the term conspiracy is defined as, quote, an agreement between two or more people to perform a harmful act. Now, given that definition, if you look carefully at the deliberate withholding of efficiency in the market system, the use of planned obsolescence, both deliberate and uh, indirect, you see that nearly every act of production, advertising, and distribution is conspiratorial by definition. So first you, so first you just knock that stupid term out of the way, which has been is a basically a semantic label now used to degrade anybody that questions anything that the establishment does. And uh, you get that out of the way and relate the fact that we're based on statistics, we're based on approaches and methods that have worked in the past, namely, of course, not to drill it into the ground, but the scientific method. Um, as far as the hidden agenda thing, I, you just, just ignore people that have nothing better to do than to uh, say things like that. There's nothing uh, in the way of our in our functioning. There's nothing in our functional operation that should give rise to any ideas like that. It's propagandists out there that have decided to belittle this project, coming mainly from religious dispositions because of certain end times beliefs and things like that. So they reinterpret modern events in a way that makes it convenient to promote their uh, religious prophecies. Number fourteen. I'm a video game designer. How might one use this medium to spread some of the knowledge you and others have presented? Do you or Jacques have any ideas on the possibility for educational games to access, demonstrate, or stimulate this knowledge and the Venus Project? I think that'd be a brilliant medium. Video games, of course, are very popular with younger kids. Uh, ideally, you want to promote social values, independent thought, and cooperation as a, as a general set. Um, I think that's a great idea, and I think in time such things will emerge. And they can still be very creative and cutting edge. Uh, I, I do think that people need to begin moving away from the military-supported games. Uh, we've gone from G.I. Joe to uh, these war games to games based explicitly on violence. And while most people can differentiate between the two, it still plants seeds. It still plants bizarre, neurotic associations with whipping out guns. When I was a little kid, my mother used to be terrified because I used to get lots of guns and stick them in my drawers and I would watch gangster movies. I'd pull out all my guns and watch gangster movies. I was like, you know, nine. I mean, that goes to show how powerful this influence in our culture actually is. I mean, guns are like toys in, in, for kids. It's amazing. And then we would get surprised when, we, when, you know, people get obsessed with guns and people join the military and they look at it as a game. That was one of the more amusing things in Michael Moore's documentary, Bowling, uh, excuse me, uh, Fahrenheit 9-11 where he goes to Iraq and he's interviewing all these kids and you can just see the blatant gaming mentality in all of them. The gestures of their influence. But uh, anyway. Number 15. Peter, I often hear Jacques talk about opinions being obsolete in the future. When I lar <clears throat> While I largely agree, there are some things that will always be open to individual interpretation, such as paintings. I know this is a very petty problem, but I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Well, a person's opinion on a painting, you know, doesn't have that much of a social consequence. We're talking fundamentally about utility and functional ideas. A, a painting certainly has influence, like all art, but it isn't always, but it is always more subjective than, say, the law of gravity or physics. I, the difference between an opinion and, say, an understanding is that opinions deny scientific thought, generally speaking. For example, I could have an opinion. Right now I'm looking at one of my walls, and it's uh, off-white. And I could say, being, we'll just say hypothetically, that someone walks into my space and says, hey, this wall is green. And they say, well, this is my opinion, this wall is green, and that's that and even though it's obviously white. So I call in a spectrum analysis. I get a spectrum analysis machine, and there's a, we do a spectrum analysis on the color, and 
it comes the light reflection and it comes back and it shows specifically that through the light spectrum that this color is within the average range of what could be called white. And you show that analysis to the individual that thinks it's green and they say, oh, I don't care about the scientific information. I, it's my opinion and I have a right to my opinion and I think it's green. So I think that's, that's, that should be an easy enough example. Uh, to give a, a more broad example, people say, I believe there is an all-seeing entity that regulates all of our behavior known as God. And you say, well, where's the evidence to support that? And they say, I don't need evidence. It's a matter of faith. And that's an opinion. So evidence, you know, understanding, let me think of a better way to explain this. No understanding is 100%. So it's a gray area. On one side, you have erroneous opinion with little regard for environmental confirmation through feedback. And on the other side, you have vigorous scientific thought and testing. And that's, that's, that's the spectrum, so to speak. Uh, there's no, it's a gray area. There's no finite conclusions, as we all know. But uh, opinion is inherently based on an emotional reaction, usually in a form of indoctrination, typically. So I hope that answers your question. It's a difficult one. So when Jalar talks about opinions, he's talking about erroneous things that people just come up with and they don't test it. And that's basically it. If people can't defend, if the, whatever the method of evaluation is, if it doesn't hold up to any form of scrutiny, then naturally it can't be taken seriously. So if someone looks at one book and believes everything the book says just because it's written in a book, well, that's, that's a very poor, a poor degree of evaluation. It's going to take some type of environmental confirmation. To, uh, to allow that. So I hope that makes sense. That's a very interesting question. I wish I had a better way to explain that. I'm going to give that, state, give that question more thought in the future so I can try and explain it uh, in a way that might be a little bit more accessible. Number 16, Peter, in my opinion, the best way to arrive at a resource-based economy rather than establishing self-sufficient communities, as some advocate in the forums, would be to bring about necessary changes to the mainstream society. In this case, making energy freely available for all would be the most cru crucial advance to reach a resource-based economy. What do you think is the best way to achieve this? For example, lobbying the local governments to invest in renewable energy sources and distributing it without cost to its inhabitants, inhabitants excuse me, and encouraging and insisting individuals and industries to become energy independent by installing their own solar panels and wind turbines, etc. I admire your train of thought, my friend, but we live in a world of economic growth or quote-unquote economic growth. So think about it this way. The moment that any organization attempts to do something for free just because it's in abundance is going to be met with a disproportionate amount of suffering because that organization cannot exist basically in this system, this socioeconomic system, because money is in charge of everything. Uh, in other words, there, it's very difficult for there to be one or the other. I can think of schemes, and I'm going to talk about this in the new film and in the presentation, schemes that you would consider to be step-by-step. -step that could move into, into, um, into a resource-based economy. But I'm going to always bring up the caveat that there's nothing in our current system that really allows that, except for massive government subsidies, which I really don't think would ever happen, because the profit industries, the major profit industries, are the most powerful and most important elements of our life. For a, there's no, if all of the, the cartels run all of the major industries for a reason, because they're that important, they're that profitable. Energy, which, as we know, is an outrageous abundance, I would say in, in regard to the sun alone, approaching infinite, but that's not true, obviously. But based on our current usage and based on what's available, as been statistically pointed out in Zeitgeist Adenda, we have an immense amount of energy, and yes, through automated systems, it should be free. But do you really think the establishment will ever come to terms with that? I don't know the answer to that. I really hope they would. Could we push that in a lobby? I don't know. Because economic GDP, excuse me, GDP is based on economic turnover. If you socialize something and you make it free, you're going to be reducing GDP. You're going to be reducing employment, too, because in order to do so, you have to make things automated. So for energy to be free, you have to have an automated system, and then you have to have a distribution system that's also automated. They're, that's because in this system, obviously, you people sell their sell their labor for income, so if you have people working in this industry, naturally can't be working as free in the system. I hope that makes sense. So there's a massive catch-22. There's a, You're stuck between a rock and a hard place with this. It's, uh, it's tough. But uh, I can think of many different, many different examples of that. 
for example, the, the labor industry. As we've been talked about for, for many, many decades, we have all of this new technology which should be freeing us from labor. Idealistically, what would have happened is that the work week would have been broken down into five days, four days, three days. The hours would have been broken down to eight-hour day, five-hour day, two-hour day. And to have a nice, beautiful, clean progression, slowly moving towards absolute freedom, so to speak, and and uh, essentially the removal of the economic system as we know it, because it wouldn't be applicable anymore because there isn't enough work for people to do, so to speak, at least in the sense of what we're describing. It, in other words, there'd be a large enough percentage of people that are out of work to make the system falter. And that's, of course, what's going to happen anyway. But this would be a gradual awareness. This would be awareness of that, and rather than allow the inevitable consequence, they would be a move to buffer that and then transition into a new system that doesn't use it, doesn't use the economic structure, doesn't use the monetary system. But again, back to the original point, this hasn't happened because the entire value of a country is based on its GDP. The corporations want nothing more than to continue their, event, their differential advantage and their gain. Therefore, it's to exploit labor, not to free people. There's never the intent to give people more free time in the system. It's literally impossible in the system. Um, I hope that makes sense. It goes against the very nature of what we consider progress in an economic system to allow people to have more free time and not be overworked. If a new company gets a nice machine that improves someone's productivity by 300%, they are going to expect that person's productivity to increase by whatever that percentage is, coupled with the amount of – excuse me, let me change that example. If a person can be replaced by a machine – and have 100% efficiency with that replacement. But no, if the company knows that if they couple up and they give the person the machine and the, the improvement is 1,000%, we'll say hypothetically, the corporation is going to see the 1,000% improvement and they're going to jump on that. So it's all relativistic. The more improvements there are, the more it just, it's more dollar signs appear in the eyes of the people that run the corporations. And, uh, and that's that. I, I hope that it is a relative way, relatively decent way to explain that. It's against the fabric of the system to have a step-by-step -step progress because it, it means the the ruining of the system itself. Um, that's a that's a great point. I really wish uh, you know that's basically what the sort of socialism socialism idea is as it exists today. You have healthcare. Healthcare is given to people, and it's done so in a specific manner that invariably probably hurts the economy. Why is the United States such a powerful economy? Because it's absolute free enterprise. It doesn't mean it's beneficial. I mean, I believe the United States is, is under number 20 or 25 in life expectancy. The health of Americans are horrible. Uh, all that aside, the real issue comes down to the fact that it is counterproductive for the establishment to allow such things. I'm going to leave it at that because I'll just keep rambling on different points that pop in my head. Uh, I hope I've made that uh, I've made enough examples to show how that how difficult that's going to be. But I absolutely agree with your point. And again, I'm going to I'm going to make that exact point in the new film, and uh, just to get people angry because if the the reasoning is there and it could be fluid, but the every element of this system is going to make it make it uh, make it difficult because there's nothing, there's no precedent for it. There's nothing to allow it to move. Number 17, in a resource-based economy, everything is provided for everyone, which eliminates the need for money. These resources are primarily, but not limited to food, clothing, and shelter. My first question is how close are we to generating, manufacturing these resources, particularly food and shelter? It is, is it 10, 20, 40 years off? I'm confused on what you're asking. First of all, everything you see today can instantly be turned around and made available to everyone at no cost, period. The amazing thing is that the efficiency is so limited today by the deliberate withholding of efficiency, uh, the planned obsolescence, the need to, per to perpetuate scarcity, that without those limitations in a new system, you would see a cataclysmic rise in productivity. Uh, I see no limitations on on the resources and manufacturing. Uh, it's all there. It just needs to be turned around and refocused and moved in the other direction from preserving scarcity to perpetuating abundance. Having factories not run from 9 to 5, but running 
So I hope that makes sense. Number 18, how are we going to generate enough food for the increasing amount of people in the world? Elimination of the use of fossil fuels would obliterate much, much of the agricultural industry. Sure, there's hydroponics, aeroponics, fish farming, and vertical skyscraper farms, but are all of these enough to generate a sufficient amount of food for the world's population? I feel as though much of the Zeitgeist movement is directed towards public awareness and less towards discussing tangible solutions such as agriculture. That's, I, I think Jacques has made some tremendous uh, points on the, the amazing possibilities of agriculture. First of all, I would disagree with the statement that, um, that elimination of the use of fossil fuels would obliterate much of the agricultural industry. But that's not true. Uh, there are plenty of other sources of energy that can power that. And it's already automated as it is. You just have to make sure that it's running on energy that's not based on fossil fuel. Batteries could do that. I hope I understand your point. I mean, I, I assume you're not referring to insecticides and oil-based things like that. In the event that some type of fossil-based chemical was necessary, well, it could be made available. It's not that you just ignore all of the uh, the fossil elements. Uh, but I don't think that's what you're asking. So I don't see the the, the problem with that. As far as food being generated for the entire world population. Right now, over 14% of the world's population are starving. Uh, this is just unbelievable. And, and this is entirely due to economics. It's not, and it's not just food prices itself. It's the cost of land, facilities, and resources. You've got to remember that um, food prices are rel relative to all the stuff that's had to go into it. And if a poor country can't get the resources necessary to even start a farm, then obviously they can't grow anything. So it's a chain reaction, and it's really purely economic. I, I see absolutely no reason why um, why you can't grow food everywhere on multiple planes, in skyscrapers, through hydroponics. Uh, I think the abundance of food, I'm going to work on the statistics of that as well. I do have some statistics written down that aren't in front of me right now. But the abundance of general agricultural production is tremendous. And I, there's no reason why, uh, why anybody should be starving. In fact, Jacques once explained to me that in the transition, he had a concept for making, making high-density, nutritious food in, in the form of what you could generally refer to as, or excuse me, what you would identify with is sort of what astronauts use. You make tubes of nutrients, and you send them to every impoverished nation on the planet. And they might not be the most tasty thing, but they have access to nutrition, period. Nutrition is a technical process. So you make that available to them, and you could do that. Um, you could do that very efficiently. You could do that in a lot of ways chemically too, uh, especially when you get into vitro or you get into nanotechnology. That's much more advanced. It's not even necessary to even talk about that actually, but uh, you can you can make it happen. And I think that's a beautiful point. This is what really should be done. You shouldn't be people shouldn't be sending food to poor excuse me sending uh, money to poor countries, and they shouldn't be sending general food either. They should be sending condensed forms of nutritious, packed, prepackaged, isolated. Uh, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, condensed food, I suppose. It was food that you add water to. This is the stuff that should be sent in high abundance all over the planet to feed those that don't have access to food. Um, if there was any logic in uh, reality in uh, this system, that's exactly what would be done. Instead, you have these silly commercials for people sending money. Then it goes through the entire bureaucracy. Then eventually you end up with some kid with a thing of Campbell's soup. Uh, as though that has any real relevant nutrients or can sustain them. Well, you could have something with the exact same space that would take up a can of Campbell's soup, but that could feed them for a month if the energy was put towards doing that. Number 19, will gun owners, advocates be welcomed in this resource-based economy? <laughs> That's the wrong question. First, there's no ownership. And the advocacy of guns is really the advocacy of reasons to use them. The real question is, would people have a reason to use guns in a resource-based economy? I would say that there are three fundamental reasons uh, for guns in the world today. One is to perpetuate crime. Uh, two is for personal protection, protection. And three is for sport. The crime issue loses its relevance once the system is set up where everything is made available to everyone else. There's nothing to steal. You can't sell it because there's no means to do so. Protection is based on fear, fear of losing what one owns, directly related to crime. 
the motivation for crime ceases, the motivation for protection ceases. So all you're really left with is sport. And sport, I believe, well, shooting things for sport is a ancient, primitive notion dating way back to early civilization in tradition where people had to do it for food. And I think in time it will vanish just like all of the old ancient practices that um, that have been existing. So I, I don't, you know, if people want guns to kill something with, uh, there's really, for no utility purpose, just for fun. And this is a value judgment on my my end, but that's a heavily distorted frame of mind because there's no reason for it other than a contrived sense of satisfaction based on a form of primitive conditioning. So I hope that doesn't sound too arrogant, but um, and I could probably find more reasons to ex- to express that. But um, you know, the only reason you want a gun is for sport and a resource-based economy, really. And I think that's an obsolete uh, reason. Number twenty. If we talk about the balance within the movement. Looking at, fa- looking at the fact that many people have a problem with the scientific method, how do you intend that people can actually see the movement as being scientifically grounded? The movement is scientifically grounded based on statistics and reason. That's it. Uh, if we have an idea that can be done, we create the statistics and the structure and the model to do it. It's not, again, opinions. It's based on the highest form of understanding we can come up with. And with new advancements of artificial intelligence, this will increase profoundly. So I hope that uh, answers your question. There were other parts of this question, but uh, this, what I just read, summarized it. The movement will be seen as scientifically grounded once the people that are looking at it actually have a sense of what the scientific foundation of thought is. And uh, granted, there's lots of things, that, lots of research that we haven't done yet, but uh, I think uh, the inference that's been generated is still scientific in and of itself. There are plenty of things that might be proven wrong, but I think, uh, generally speaking, science is on our side with the general philosophy, so to speak, that we're, we're presenting. The highest efficiency of the world is the world working as one organism, and that can be proven from almost every single angle. The only angle that people throw out, and this is a little bit beside the point, is their primitive associations with power and these weird, fearful elements that they think everything should be broken apart and separate because no one trusts each other. People haven't learned to trust each other in the system, and it's about time they learn. Number 21, what do you think of this pen and Teller statement about world peace? And it reads, so far the only proven way of stopping war long term has been letting people buy and sell from each other, it doesn't sound all that noble, right? I want your blue jeans and you want my rock and roll. If we trade long enough and respect each other's rights long enough, maybe we can start to give ourselves the chance to be friends. I, I don't know. Um, I, have, I haven't seen the episode of Penn and Teller you're talking about. I know what it's from, though, because I've seen that series. But uh, based on this statement regarding world peace, <laughs> there's so many problems with it because it comes out of such a limited frame of reference. Um, let me just say simplistically, the trade is based on a gaming strategy. The organizations that are created to oversee the, quote, honesty of trade practice, practice do not exist in a vacuum and are constantly susceptible to the strategic benefit of pursuing vested interests. The perfect example is the FDA. The FDA started as a decent organization to oversee the well-being of uh, people in regard to industrial production and food and drugs, and now it's a cartel. It's a cartel that pushes its constituents' interests. Um, As far as global trade, international trade is really the same thing, except legal restrictions are dramatically reduced. For example, companies will move their operations to places where labor standards are the lowest. So so they can get the most out of their investment at the expense of poverty and a lack of government oversight. A classic example of this was Jamaica in the 90s. You had all these textile industries going to Jamaica because there was no oversight. They could work these people 12, 15 hours a day. They didn't have to give them any benefit. They could pay them an obscenely small wage. They would regulate their bathroom breaks by maybe one or two every five or six hours. You had photographs of women. This is the 1990s. Uh, it still exists today. Women that had to wear had to wear garments around their waist because... 
because um, when they're menstruating, they'd be bleeding, but they couldn't go anywhere. They weren't allowed to leave their seat. So you'd see all the blood stains all over the place, things like that. This is, uh, this is the modern slavery world that we live in today, which is cloaked as globalization. So back to my point, you're always dealing with a gaming strategy in the system, with everyone looking to exploit a weakness for their own gain, and no legislation will ever stop such abuse. For the legislators are in business as well. The whole world is run by a purely fascist frame of reference at this point. The corporations are the governments, for they are the breadwinners which support the whole system. They are the ones that have... That's, that's enough stated. I don't want to run that into the ground. I think, uh, I think that should be clear enough. As far as... There's other ridiculous points about the Penn and Teller quote. World peace will not come from trade. World peace will come from the world learning to work together. Number 22... Have you given any thought to where the prototype city would be built? And if so, would it not be easier to build it in a country that isn't as big as the United States and has maybe a bit more flexible government and less religion? It may be a bit too soon to be thinking about that, but it might speed up the process. Well, first of all, I'd say that religion isn't necessarily as relevant a point. Extreme fundamentalist religion will definitely get in the way with something like this. But um, the classic example is the movie Contact that Carl Sagan wrote. So they find this blueprint to build a machine that uh, can go in outer space through, uh, well, they didn't describe it at that point, but nevertheless to communicate with some other uh, extra, extra stellar force, the aliens, and the religious community freaks out and thinks that the people are talking to God, and they blow up the first prototype, first, well, the first creation of the, uh, the mechanism, the vehicle that was used for this transport. I think that's actually a very, uh, very honest uh, assessment of what the possibilities are when it comes to religious fanaticism. But um, nevertheless, most people aren't that extreme. And as far as a country of where to build it, it would be a country, hopefully, that is somewhat socialist. Um, you know, it, where, first of all, the, the establishment would be an exposition center, fundamentally, not a commune. It would require an area with as many resources as possible, naturally. Um, this would allow for less initial trade. Uh, to get the city going. As far as the government, you know, a more socialist, humane quality is certainly preferable to a self-interested self-interest, capitalist one. I would definitely say that. I happen to keep thinking that Latin America is a good place. It's rich in resources. There are a lot of open land that hasn't uh, succumbed to uh, industrialization. Um, and there are some decent socialist leaders out there that uh, I think once they, even though all, leader, all leaders are corrupt in this system, keep that in mind. They have to be corrupt to be where they are. But they might be able to turn a blind eye with certain weaknesses to allow something like this to begin its first stage. And uh, they certainly would look, be looked upon with a certain degree of honor, I think, if they were to do so. And, and that's the hope, that uh, it would take, someone will be altruistic enough to, uh, to allow it. But to answer your question, singularly, yes, the most resources and the most open government. Number 23. I have two questions for you. First of all, I absolutely agree that politicians are irrelevant, but couldn't it be the first step to vote for people like Dennis Kucinich or Ron Paul, who both reject the banking fraud? Yes, I, I, if Ron Paul was to run for president again, I'd probably vote for him just out of a poetic statement, given the nonsensical reality we live in. Um, at least he knows certain points that are relevant. Uh, Dennis Kucinich equally as much. Uh, these are these are very well-meaning individuals. I can tell you lots of things I disagree with them about because they don't look at the larger picture that we're trying to talk about. But nevertheless, uh, yes, I mean the we want allies wherever we can find them. And maybe one day Dennis Kucinich might turn over and he might say, you know what, this is a great idea. It probably would happen when he's out of politics because that's usually when most of these individuals begin to open up more so. But nevertheless, who knows? Um, I would love to see the Federal Reserve be audited and shut down, as Ron Paul is attempting to do. I hate to break it to everybody, but that's probably never going to happen. The Fed has simply been given more power since the collapse of the economy. And while Congress might make such a move, the Fed is basically above the law on a certain level. Um, it's a complex point, but uh, while Congress could shut down the Fed in one pen stroke, I would have to say that the power that the Fed yields really, really makes Congress shiver. Number 24. 
Could you define aberrant behavior and the carrying capacity of the Earth? Sure. Aberrant is defined as deviating from the um, natural or established way, I suppose. The It works on a few levels, though. First, um, let's see, you have a, cr a criminal who steals in our society. He's considered aberrant for he's deviating from the current state of normality. It's considered abnormal for someone to steal something, even though it's actually pure no normality. But it's a it's an ele it's a reduced distinction. It's a detached distinction. Uh, corporations are constantly stealing. Planned obsolescence is pure theft, but it's inadvertent and it's hidden. It's not inadvertent. It's hidden theft. It's theft over time, theft by inefficiency when knowing that you can have efficiency. And on a larger level of aberrancy, uh, you can consider the system itself to be aberrant um, for its unsustainable and other reasons that would relate to things that would limit its survival. So that's a complex question. The way that Jacques and I use aberrant behavior is usually to note something that has a negative effect. Um, if something is not positive in the broadest sense of the word, meaning it isn't supporting something that um, it isn't in support of something that's progressive and helpful. And again, these are semantic and subjective terms, but bear with me. If it's not that, then it's going to be aberrant. Survival of the species and the sustainability of our cultural institutions uh, and how they relate to our well-being are natural orders. It's survival and the sustainability of the species, and of course, preserving the environment to support the species, and of course, every larger order of that, every magnet, larger order of magnification you can find from the well-being of the planet, so you don't destroy this rainforest to limit this item. You'll find that the human species is one of the few species that actually has the capacity to overshoot virtually everything. For example, ants. Ants are, of course, little chemical machines, and they're totally social. But it's amazing if you analyze ants, and there's the books by Edward O. Wilson on ant life. Uh, unbelievable what ants are capable of doing as far as their awareness and awareness of what they do. For example, ants will climb trees, and they'll eat just enough of the tree, knowing that it's going to come back and flourish. They don't destroy the tree. They eat just enough, and they move to another section. And then they move back to the tree after it has regrown. They They know that... They know how to use the environment in a way that is sustainable and make sure that regeneration is constant. We aren't doing that, and as far as I'm concerned, all of the methods we're using are basically aberrant because they're out of line with nature. And that's why understanding natural law is so important in the broadest level, as complex as it, as it is. Number 25, will the system slash elite slash new world order who undoubtedly are aware of technological unemployment allow this to happen? I think there are two possible answers. One, they will find us new jobs, or two, order out of chaos, they will bring in the new world order. Any light shed on, this, on these quite scary thoughts would be appreciated. Well, first of all, my friend, I don't share the definition of new world order that you do. New world order is not an elite group. It's a tendency that's continually generated for monopolistic domination. It's, uh, it is a free enterprise notion on one side. Well, it is a monetary gaming strategy notion on one side. I'm not going to use the word free enterprise per se because it's too limited. And then it's an ego manifestation on, on another side. The New World Order is a tendency, and I think it's important people realize this. I don't even use that language. Uh, New World Order is probably one of the most empty terms out there at this point. I'm nothing but bored stupid at these radio talk show hosts and various personalities that seem to think that babbling about this invisible ruling elite is the highest echelon of social activism they could come up with. And it gets very superstitious as well. Suddenly everything in the world is a, is a everything wrong in the world is a product of this infamous Illuminati derived New World Order elite. And it's a fantasy and the whole thing is fucking stupid, to put it plainly. Blatantly. Sorry for my, sorry for my curtness on that, but it's very frustrating. So to answer your question in a more balanced fashion, I think that the establishment might attempt to create a new sector for employment. In fact, it's a natural gravitation to do so, but there really isn't one. And as far as the notion of some type of dramatic turn of world government, which is basically what the New World Order, at least the initial staple of this New World Order concept, comes from, 
it's world government is going to be an emergent amalgam as well. So even if they were able to make that type of move, it's going to keep changing as well. Uh, again, it goes back to fantasy of this elite that wants to exterminate 90% of the population because some stones uh, somewhere in, in the States, I don't know what it is. These, the, the, there's some engraved on some rock that says that the planet population should be reduced to 500,000 people. And these New World Order fanatics have jumped on this thinking that it has this is some plan and then uh, you know, stuff like this. Anyway, I don't want to babble on too much about this, but invariably uh, informing the people of what's possible is going to overcome all of these fantasies, even if they're real or not. Uh, they can't just bring in world government overnight. It's not going to happen like that. We already have world government. They're known as trade unions, as I denote in Zeitgeist 1. It's a world monopoly that's sought by the cartels in power because that's the highest echelon of their power, which continues their profit and continues their ego. That is, that is the world state issue, and that is what to be fearing. Because once the resources are really hoarded holistically, we're in a lot of trouble, and they, al they almost all are. And that's really what it comes down to. If, if the powers that be, so to speak, control all of the resources that exist, we are screwed. And, and that's going to cause nothing but conflict as well. And I don't think the quote-unquote new order that's projected by all of these you know, activists and all of these people that can't stop talking about it, what they don't understand is that there's no way for this to work. It's impossible. It's a fantasy. And by the way, if you want to understand what the New World Order really is, as, as history is dictated, read H.G. Wells' quote, The New World Order. That is, uh, that is the best source you can find for understanding what this concept actually is, not the distorted permutations you hear people talk about so they can sell you DVDs and shirts and books. They're packaging fear in the name of the New World Order so they can continue to make money, and that really is the bottom line. Enough of that. Jesus. Number 26. There have been a lot of questions about the transition at the social physical level, but not much has been said about the transition of the individual. The fact that we are so warped and twisted due to our current value system will surely be an obstacle during the transition. Has any thought been given as to the plan of action on a personal level? Once we have a sane society, we will have sane individuals, but how can insane individuals create a sane society? Uh, well, thank you for the extremely intelligent question. The, we, we have talked about personal transition of the individual, and that's really what comes back to, uh, excuse me, that's really what social therapy is about. The communication of, of, new, of a new value system is what the Venus Project, in its largest accord, is really about. It's not a matter of technology. It's about attempting to create a new culture that works, that's in line, that's not aberrant in the most broad sense. A culture not based on self-interest, but based on a collective social interest in the sense that people realize that their self-interest is only as good as the social interest, and that's really the case. Um, if people can understand that them pursuing the social well-being is equally as important as their personal self-interest, or excuse me, as, is in fact entirely related to their personal self-interest, then this whole notion of, you know, selfishness and the human nature concept will vanish. It's almost as though if you convince people, and I don't say convince in the sense of manipulate, but if you educate them and make them understand that as long as they're only out for themselves, the world is going to suffer because if everyone's out for themselves, the world will be absolute chaos. The world will be what it is basically today. And it's going to take something along the lines of people understanding that, again, the welfare of society as a whole is the welfare of them. I, I'm not explaining that very well, but I hope that point has been made clearly in the various statements that I kind of fragmented out there. And so the individual has to learn that. The individual values, of course, have to change almost simultaneously as the technology and the environment changes. So we build an environment and we engage social therapy. We build a new city, we engage social therapy so people can understand why it works the way it does and why this method of looking at the world, why this worldview is much better and much more rational, much more sustainable than anything else and helping each other and, and all the values that evidently people think that they perpetuate, but because of the pressures of this system, they don't. And that's, that's really the issue. People are not 
people don't have the ability to be altruistic in this system to the degree that they should. I'm still amazed by the volunteer statistics. It's amazing how many people in America do volunteer, and it goes to show the amazing potential we have if we get out of this larger order conditioning that we have to be self-interested and greedy and look out for ourselves and ignore everybody else and not worry about anybody else's well-being. So I hope that answers your question. You know, the I like how you ended it with once we have a sane society, once we have a sane society, we will have sane individuals, but how can insane individuals create a sane society? In the, insane individuals cannot create a sane society, and this is why the Zeitgeist Movement exists. We're trying to get those that have some element of sanity, at least in a certain level, and attempt to perpetuate that sanity with everybody else. It's an educational uh, thing we're trying to do. Again, the word is social therapy. So I hope that helps. I, I think that's a, a, a tremendous point. And um, it's, it goes back to the notion that we can't just build some commune that's self-sustaining. It's much more profound than that. Number 27, how are we going to prevent the infliction of violence from those individuals who will still confront scarcity outside of the resource-based economy cities upon resource-based economy residents? To rephrase the question, what is going to prevent the concentration of this violence upon the defenseless abundance of the resource-based economy cities and its residents? Well, first of all, I think you're assuming that these cities will exist as a commune, and they're not. The, the cities, I hope, the Prototype cities can exist, I think, multiple ones as research centers and as expositions for other people to come and see what the future can hold, as theme centers, centers as Jacques would describe. I completely understand your general point, though. Your larger principle is that you can't, um, you can't have uh, a, an open society coupled with, at least not on a large scale. I know there's smaller ones that exist in the form of communes. You can't have an open society that's large coexist in a world where there's massive capitalism, property, property, and resource ownership. Because A, the open society, the non-monetary society, somehow has to get those resources that are going to be owned by all the people that, um, that are existing in the profit system and in the property-based system. So I see your problem. It's, uh, it can't exist in a vacuum is really the answer. I have to speed up here. It's only a quarter after four uh, in New York time, and I'm not even halfway through these. So let me move faster and stop rambling. Number 26. Hey, Peter, I got into a debate about the free market and sweatshops and was trying to pass, excuse me, and the person was trying to pass sweatshops, pass sweatshop working as right and providing jobs, along with stating I was wrong, even though I showed him the statistics, statements from sweatshop workers, investments gone to them, etc. He ignored it all, excuse me, investigations gone to them. He ignored it all and repeated his statement. How will I go about dealing with people like this? Well, I got to be perfectly candid, don't. If your logical statements don't have any effect and they can only counter with broad labels or broad glossed over opinions, then move on. There are billions of people on this planet. I know it's difficult with family members. You're, maybe you have a family member that doesn't want to listen to any of these ideas. Well, there's other positive ways you can re interact with them. Uh, it's better not to create conflict. There are, again, billions of people on this planet. Many of them uh, will be more open to this idea based on their experience and lack of indoctrination versus others that have heavy indoctrination. So just keep moving around and talking to different people. And when you get somebody that's interested in it, make sure you, you pull them in and you, you show them the site and you show them the movies and you talk to them more so. And just do whatever you can to get them to try and be proactive about it. And that's really the next step after they understand it to a certain degree. Number 27, the idea of computers taking over decision making is maybe a logical step, but don't you think there should be limits? Logical would also logical would also mean that computers choose our partners based on genetic compatibility in order to minimize heredity diseases, maximize intelligence, etc. Also, genetic manipulation, like in the movie Gattaca, would be a logical step. Personally, I find such development very precarious. Well, my friend, I think you're taking this idea to an unnecessary extreme, and also projecting some conditioned fears that are, I think are more or less unfounded. First of all, the idea of computers picking who hooks up with who is, is really kind of silly, don't you think? While there might be some type of genetic relationship, that's really beside the point. People, based on their environmental conditions, relate to others who have shared values, and typically people that share equal values or close to equal values tend to, tend to rendezvous and hook up 
and and our friends or have relationships. That's really the, the state of things. We're not listening to computers to tell us how to live our lives. The computers are there as tools to tell us the most efficient means to operate society in a technical, utility-based level. That's basically it. I mean, there might be larger order things that occur through artificial intelligence, but it's not it's not what you make it out to be. This isn't. Um, we're not giving over everything to computers. Computers work for us. As far as Gattaca and genetic manipulation, there's a really scary reality that I think people should uh, should understand. First of all, genetic genetic um, genetic manipulation is a tool, nothing more. It can be used for good. It can be used for bad, just like nuclear fusion. The issue really comes down to, in my mind, as a as a case example, if in this system it gets to a point where we can genetically modify people in utero to not have propensities for certain types of illnesses, to strengthen certain attributes of, of their physiology to a point which makes them, quote, superhuman in some way, the only people that are going to have access to those abilities are the people with lots of money. So what you might have is something very, very dangerous. You might have a break in the species if this system is allowed to continue because you'll have people that can afford genetically modifying themselves and improving themselves in, in amazing ways, live at longevity, and you're going to have the less fortunate, the poorer people that live with their, their general uh, physiology as dictated by the natural, natural, natural unfolding of their birth and uh, physiology. So this is a huge problem to consider. And that's really a more relevant problem. I think it, genetic uh, stuff is just a tool. Wouldn't it be beautiful to be able to fix someone's nearsightedness uh, when they're in utero somehow? I, I don't know if that's possible. I'm just pointing that out. So no one have to wear glasses. Uh, granted, it gets spooky when you think about bizarre extremes of it, which science fiction takes hold of. But you have to look at it from a principal level. And again, back to my prior point. If we allow the market system to continue and people with money can genetically modify themselves and their kids while people with money, without money cannot, you're going to see a division of the species in a very caustic way. And if you talk about social hierarchy, you're going to see some very sick things probably start to occur. And that really shouldn't be allowed to happen, which is probably another great reason why everything needs to be accessible to everyone. Um, I hope that makes sense. Number 28. Could you please explain significantly on the concept of interdisciplinary teams, specifically how they are formed based on project needs, uh, i.e., someone coming up with the idea, they get to work with others with knowledge in that in those areas? I believe a more in-depth explanation of various possible scenarios and circumstances could help put a lot of new members' minds at ease. Well, I think it was fairly well explained in the activist orientation guide. This isn't much an activist orientation guide. The orientation guide is a better, better term. And activism is going you know, to develop more so later as we get more numbers. Um, but essentially, interdisciplinary teams have to do with people that study a specific field. They engage the system which evaluates their ideas. This can be, come in the form of a web page, I think, is the simplest example, even though it could be a lot more complex than that. They present a blueprint. Let's say, for example, um, someone has an idea for an improvement to some form of transportation vehicle. Say we have the maglev trains in operation. Someone has done independent research in their home, for example, and they've realized that if they tweak one specific aspect of the electromagnetic frequency through certain you know, electrical manipulation, I'm just going to throw this out there, they, that the efficiency of this maglev train will increase by 20%. What they do is they create, with their technical knowledge, the schematic that shows the relevance of this. It shows in scientific terms, in scientific language, what this is. They submit it to a system that can evaluate the technical processes in a technical form through artificial intelligence. This is at the highest echelon. The system will immediately see the logic to this because it's based on technical understanding. The system can verify that it will actually work based on its extremely profound range of inferential logic and, of course, access to resources to see if something like this is even possible technically based on the materials at hand. Once that is done, there's no question, there's no voting. It says, boom, this is much more efficient than what we're doing now, and boom, it's handed off to interdisciplinary teams, if necessary, where it's put into operation. So in that example, the person, once they've submitted that concept, it's pushed through the system, there's really nothing that they even need to do at that point. Because it's the most optimized and the resources are there, it's put into practice. 
It's that simple. No investment strategies, no corporates, corporations, no IPOs, no employees, nothing. The operations are streamlined to create instant efficiency as those efficiency-based ideas come about. As far as other examples of how people participate, the teams that are maybe more complex, that need more thought, need more thorough evaluation, we'll say in that example, say that the the requirements are not all, while the logic is perfect, the requirements are still have specific variables that need more thought on a human level, which could happen, then that person will be called upon and invited to join the team, his team, so to speak, that will work on that particular item. I'm trying to think of an example in modern society that this can relate to, because I know when people hear this, they, they think it's too fanciful, and they think it's just, it's too, they don't see the practicality of it because they're not used to the all the complexity of society today. But the individual joins the team and they part of the team that does the research on it. And, and that's basically it. And it's implemented through automated systems uh, as advanced as those systems can be at that point in time to make it fully streamlined. That's essentially it. It's really that simple. You submit to an automated system. The system evaluates, does the initial evaluation. If it sees merit in it, it's submitted to people that review it and see how to do it. Very often, new information will come about and the system is lagged and updating. This could happen, though I think once artificial intelligence comes to fruition, you're going to see a rampant extreme of the cognitive ability. If you read someone, if you read um, an age of intelligent machines or an age of spiritual machines um, like, like, uh, by uh, Kurzweil, uh, he talks about the reality that that machines will exceed human intelligence. He takes it to various extremes, but you can see his logic, and eventually machines will overcome the rational thought processes. They'll excite the rational thought processes to a point where we can't even comprehend what they're doing. And that's, of course, scary for people to, that's a little bit beside the point. But I think that people are underestimating how much advancement is really possible in this field. And it's not going to take tons and tons of people to get something done. So I've rambled on that one quite a bit. I hope uh, that explanation suffices to a certain degree. Let me try to give it one more shot. You submit to the machine technology. The machine technology evaluates it. And if it's doable, it's put into practice immediately through automated systems. If it requires more interest, then people are brought in, you are brought in, and you become a part of the team that does the technical research and development, which eventually will go right back in to the, to the system that you presented to initially. Number 29. And by the way, that, from that prior question, there's all sorts of variables that people will throw out that aren't familiar with this idea um, as far as what decisions are. They throw out uh, issues with democracy and voting because they think that they should have a choice on things that are submitted to the system. The choice is based on relevancy, and this is a really important point. The, the decision is based on does it work, not do you think you, it will work or do you like it. It's, it's a matter of it working in the most humane, relevant way you can possibly think of. It's not that you just <laughs> – it's sort of like that ridiculous movie, um, I, Robot, where at the end of the movie, the automation system – excuse me, the artificial intelligence system has decided that it's more efficient for the planet for the human species to be eradicated, if I remember correctly. <laughs> While that might hold true in principle on some vast level – you have to remember that we are making all of this technology for the advancement of us and the advancement of our preservation, and we wouldn't get to a point, based on the way the, the, the logic would unfold, we wouldn't get to a point where we would ever be a threat enough to have the machine decide that we couldn't be in existence. I hope that makes sense. It, would, it wouldn't occur because there'd be this massive gap that could be easily filled in by renovations of our operation so that that wouldn't be a reality. I hope that makes sense. I'm going to stop talking about it right now because because I'll just keep rambling in various abstract ways. Really, I think in the activist orientation guide, it's laid out quite simply, so please read that again. And uh, I apologize if any of my statements were confusing in, in the prior address. Number 29, 29, can you give a short list of the most common objections you receive when discussing the concept of a resource-based economy? Your specific rebuttals are not necessary. I plan to use them as, plan to use a list to create individual threads. Uh, sure. I wrote down a quick list. Uh, the first one is it's communism and collectivism just can't work. These are labels that are thrown out. Um, I don't use the term collectivism. I use the term cooperatism. And there's no one that could refute that cooperation is always more powerful. More minds are always more powerful than one. 
Number two, they say that money is the only incentive, and without it, people will just be lazy. This is your standard propaganda that uh, apparently people have to be motivated by their own personal self-interest and uh, reward, and without it, they just won't have any motivation to do anything. Number three, humans are too greedy and narrowly self-interested for it to work. This is, of course, the assumption that uh, we'll always have somebody that wants to rule somebody else and and tie them up and beat them, and that's just the nature of human nature. If you give someone an edge, they're going to take it. And that, while that makes sense in our current system because that's how you get ahead, there's no evidence to support that that we are naturally brutal, greedy, narrowly self-interested in, in by our, our general quote-unquote nature. Number four, it will bring regimentation and lack of freedom and stifle creativity. This is a more complex one. This is based on, you know, the, the old Soviet concept that in order to have a collectivist, quote, society where people are supported in some way by the state with a planned system, in other words, uh, it's going to produce regimentation and lack of freedom. Um, that is that was historically the case with the Soviet Union, but that that was that occurred because of many different reasons, having to do with the self-preservation, having to do with maintaining various very corrupt aspects of that system. Therefore, they had to restrict people. What in this system, regimentation is absolutely thwarted. It's based on reasoning. Regimentation is only um, excuse me. I see. I'm, I shouldn't even be explaining this because I want to move on. Regimentation in this system is not a problem because we we want personal creativity and thought. You want everyone to have the highest form of edu education. The regimentation is on the freedom of thought and the openness and the, of course, rationality of the individual. People will be alike in many different ways. They will oppose war. Jacques made some good points on this. They will oppose war. They will oppose human suffering. They won't turn a blind eye to problems. They won't make inefficient things because they know efficiency can be created. That's the most optimized point at that point of awareness in time. So, and as far as the lack of freedom, you know, that of course just goes right along with the same the same idea. And freedom, of course, will be massive in a resource-based economy as compared to what we see today. There's no freedom in the Western world today or almost any country today. Freedom is a complete illusion based on, in the West, what you buy. You can have your freedom of choice for 25 different types of cereal, but you have only two political parties owned by the same set of corporations. That's your American freedom. Number five would be, um, the fifth of this example would be the free market represents freedom of choice and true democracy. This, of course, relates to the prior. People have really been brainwashed to believe, because that word free is there, that giving people the ability to openly compete without any, without any rules, per se, uh, is the ultimate freedom of choice and, and hence generates true democracy. No, it generates fascism and it generates monopoly and it restricts freedom and it puts people into little cages of options. And the sixth one would be the world is not able to produce an abundance for the current population. This, of course, is the, the general disposition of most people because most people have no idea about the abundance of energy. They have no idea about the ways in which food could be created. They have no idea about automation systems, how labor could be removed, and you know, factories running 24-7. Um, they just don't know. They don't know the statistics on that. And, of course, the seventh most common uh, objection to uh, resource-based economy is you are Illuminati theosophic Satanists working to bring in the New World Order so you can exterminate 90% of the world population. Hopefully you guys won't get too much of that one. Obviously, that's a joke. Number 30, question. I feel that the focus of the radio address and many of the discussions in the forums have been spent answering hypothetical situations and debating minutia surrounding a resource-based economy. Shouldn't we start focusing more on what's going on with the activism education teams in order to promote the ideas instead of nitpicking over nuances of the ed goal? I think this is. I think this radio address serves a good function to clarify as much as possible all of the nuances and minutia that really need to be clarified. You have to be as clear as possible, and I understand your point, but I, I think it's. Uh, I really do my best, even though I'm often very tired, to try and have patience with every single question, regardless of how how minute it might seem to me but because in the end you got you have to resolve these points one way or another and they start to create caverns and people get more and more bizarre and it, it, you know they they start to dismiss the whole idea because they can't get their hand around one their head around one little issue and uh, I want to try and resolve that as 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 quickly as possible which is why the knowledge base will be there as well so 
ultimately, the um, shouldn't we start on uh, focusing on what's going? Yes, I think the activism and education teams will be will be very very important. But we can't. Uh, excuse me. The activism and education teams are in development, and to promote the ideas instead of nitpicking over nuances. Actually, hold on one second. I've got the. Uh, Got a technical problem on my side here. One moment. Okay. Yes, we are going to focus on the activism and education teams uh, more actively, by all means. Uh, sorry for that little. The the ed the education teams are very important, and they're also very complex to put together because there's so many hands at work. Uh, the chapters are very relevant. I have to uh, do a tremendous amount of work, and I've done a tremendous amount of work to attempt to get these together. We're getting heads of all of these teams, and you're going to be hearing more about that very soon once I finish the London lecture. I know I've said that a few times, but um, it's just been very, very difficult on my end because there's so much that I have to do personally. So anyway, that's going to happen. So I hope I answered your question. Number 31, what is Zeitgeist Day? Why is Zeitgeist Day on March 15th rather than some other date? Um, is it arbitrary, or did you pick that with some significance? No, but it's completely arbitrary. I have no idea why I chose that date. It just uh, it just happened to be convenient based on the first event that occurred. Uh, Zeitgeist Day 2010 might actually not occur on the 15th. It might be within a day or two around uh, due to the fact that it's not on a weekend. I think it's much easier for people to do these things on a weekend rather than on a weekday. I believe March 15th of 2010 is on a Monday, so I might do it on the 13th or the 14th. Number 32. On the Zeitgeist Movement website, you posted a poetic statement which read, It is my hope that people will not take what is said in the film as truth, but to find out for themselves, for truth isn't told, it is realized. But you have said a few times on your radio address that the public just isn't informed enough about the issues and that this is the real problem. This is in direct contradiction to truth being realized rather than told. I would like you to clear up what you really believe. Oh, sure, I think you're, you're misunderstanding a little bit about what that statement meant. The the point is very simple. You can tell somebody something, but it doesn't do anything unless they evaluate the elements of that that understanding on their own. So, you know, you can say that the world is round. Say somebody, say, hey, you know, the world's round. And you say that, especially back when everyone thought it was flat. Someone just comes up to you and says, the world is round. And they say, oh, okay, the world is round. They start walking around telling everybody the world is round. They're just repeaters. And unfortunately, in our society, we do have a lot of repeaters. But the real element is to prove it. You want, you want, uh, you want to be fully aware or cognizant of uh, of what constitutes a particular understanding. That's what realization means. It's to you know to realize something is uh, to be fully cognizant and aware of. So, I hope that uh, clarifies that point. It was just a simple poetic statement that you know, don't just believe everything in the film. It's not that I was saying that there's anything wrong with the film. It's that please look in the information yourself because the, the point was that you'll find much more information that I didn't include in that film if you take the time to look into it that will further support the film as a whole and the points made. Number 33, can you explain why you think the monetary system is a pyramid scheme and or a Ponzi scheme? Well, I prefer that you simply go watch Zeitgeist Addendum Part 1. I... Um, I uh, I don't want to sit here and explain everything, but basically, in this system, new money is always needed to continue economic growth. You have to have perpetual monetary increase in this system in order to continue to sustain every new level of social growth and economic growth. Excuse me. It's not really social growth. In other words, if you put a bunch of money in the system, a lot of new companies are going to start – a lot of new companies are going to start uh, hiring more people – getting larger offices, having higher rent, and the more money has to go into that to get more people employed and to get more businesses out there. And when money contracts, all of that stuff begins to fail, and that's really the reality of it. So it's a pyramid scheme and a Ponzi scheme because if money stops coming in, then the whole thing starts to, to contract, and that's basically it. It's, that's the entire economic system as we know it, is money coming in, uh, economic growth, money coming out, recession. And there's many variables to that. But um, and then, like I part one, I also make the point about the fractional reserve system in its very mathematical construction is also being the same thing. But I don't want to spend time on that right now. Number thirty-four: How much interest, if any, has the project drawn from persons with considerable financial wealth or influence, such as celebrities? Uh, could it hurt to write a letter to our childhood heroes, or are there better ways of getting the well-to-do on board with the project? Uh, you know, I'm not really that concerned with that. I'd love to see. 
people that are well known to support this. I obviously there's a direct conflict of interest with people that have strong financial wealth because naturally 99% of the time they're going to be in support of the system that has provided the wealth for them. Uh, almost universally, if you ask people that don't like the system, they don't have a lot of money. And you ask people that do like the system, they do have a lot of money. Uh, that's just the self-reinforcing element of it. And that's unfortunate. Um, what works to our advantage is that the income disparity is so dramatic that there are many more people that don't like the system than do. And those that arbitrarily do, it doesn't take much to get them informed, I think, to get them on the other side. But, you know, celebrity interest is, of course, great. I We have on the... Um, on the projects page, some people to to contact, usually in the form of uh, usually in the form of uh, a media contact, to the extent where we want them to hopefully do a news report or have Jacques on or something like that. But you know, who knows? Maybe some famous personality might come come hold with this. Uh, obviously, just spreading information everywhere and getting the movement as large as possible is the best way to do that. Number thirty-five. Have you heard of the FEMA concentration camps? being built in the U.S.? If so, what are your thoughts on it? I've seen numerous videos on YouTube, and honestly, I'm getting a bit scared, even though I live on the other side of the border. FEMA concentration camps today exist in the same way they did during the Second World War and during almost every period of the modern in modern history, uh, in the United States anyway. They always prepare for disasters with these things. They put Japanese in concentration camps during the Second World War, um, and now with the growing instability of the economy, it doesn't surprise me whatsoever that they prepare these things again. Uh, it's just one more way the establishment attempts to protect itself if there's total chaos in the streets. I don't believe, again, the nonsensical conspiracy notions that they're going to round everybody up and throw them in concentration camps. It's only during mass chaos will they attempt to do something like that. Um, and that's basically it. I don't agree with it. Of course, it's terrifying, but this is the establishment that you live in, and it's nothing, you know, it's really nothing new. Number 36, do you fear that the Zeitgeist movement will not succeed, like the techn technocracy idea developed decades ago with similar intentions? Uh, I have no fear of the Zeitgeist movement not succeeding. There's really no point in even thinking about that. As far as technocracy, you know, I, I see the relationship, generally speaking, but technocracy was a political movement, had lots of different problems. Here's another related question, number 37. Do you think technocracy would make a good transition from the monetary system to the Venus Project, Zeitgeist Movement Culture? If not, please give a couple reasons why. I think this has been covered uh, a few times. Technocracy has, in its initial construction when Jacques was in it, had some very bizarre notions of race and, um, and sex. Uh, it was slightly elitist, and as it exists today, I really don't know. I see technocracy as an interesting staple of some important ideas historically, but, you know, there's no reason to have to pull in technocracy or use it as a transition point when you want to move on to something else. So I think, I think, the, I think the core interest is, uh, is still sufficient. I think value-wise, the Venus Project is much more, much more applicable than technocracy ever was. Number 38 – could an incremental approach be fruitful in the transition? For example, would it be possible to extract the food production industries intact from the confines of the monetary system? What about drinking water? Can we, as a society, begin to provide these things for everyone in a manner by bypassing and ignoring the monetary system? With the basic insecurities removed, it might convince people that there is merit to abandoning the monetary system. Of course, we would want to optimize those production delivery systems that feed and more feed and that feed us, but removing money from the equation could be the first step towards the goal. That's a good idea, and uh, as I mentioned before in a similar question prior, most likely not, um, because the moment you restrict those industries, the moment money isn't transferred. It, it stops the transfer of money, so it's a, it's a socialist approach. So let's socialize health care, socialize medicine, uh, and then let's socialize electricity. And the more you socialize, the more it hurts the bottom line of GDP and um, profit for the industries at large. It's, it's unfortunately going against the grain of the entire fabric of society, as I pointed out before. I agree with the incremental approach, and I'm going to use that approach in a larger, more organized example uh, when I make the new film, most likely. And I might be even in the London presentation to, to make a better argument about that. Um, there's a lot can be stated about that from a statistical standpoint that I don't have in front of me right now. But I, again, I agree with you, but I don't think that's going to happen, as I stated before with the prior question that was similar. 
and the reasoning. Number 39, since the Zeitgeist movement is in fact trying to move from this current system to another system that is basically that another system that is basically an act of war against the status quo, what precautions do you think are necessary in regards to people's identities, web servers, meetings, etc.? Hmm. Well, I don't consider the move into another system an act of war against the status quo. They might consider it an act of war. We're simply trying to enlighten the society to move into a system where everyone's working together on a common level and stop all the outrageous competition, destruction, and waste that um, and all the aberrancies that are generated on a daily basis, which we, unfortunately we find to be normal. Um, what precautions are, do you think are necessary in regards to people's identity? Oh, I see what you're asking. What precautions as far as protecting people from the establishment? Uh, there's no protection from the establishment as far as your identity. Any, any governmental organization can find out who you are any second, any time. Uh, you just have to roll with it and uh, ignore it. If, the fear is only there if you acknowledge the fear. I don't walk around, you know, disguising my cell phone calls or, or anything like that. I, you know, there's plenty of things I just simply don't say, but it's different. I have no fear of the establishment because that's the only way you can look at it. The establishment's there to create the fear. The establishment is actually extremely disorganized. It's not this, again, this idiotic New World Order idea where it's this all, you know, all-powerful, all-encompassing thing that is watching your every move and they can just do whatever they want. There are men behind the curtain, as I've readily admitted, but they are few and they are patches in different industries that control different things. The financial system, of course, being the, the most powerful example. So, you know, the central intelligence agencies are going to look after anything that's considered a threat to the establishment, and they're going to look for reasons to come after it. And as long as there's no reasons, there's no illegal things. For example, I don't think the Zeitgeist Movement should be writing stuff on money. Uh, that That is can be, even though it's very minor, it can be misconstrued as something uh, that would be illegal, and what is illegal, that's something that might represent the movement in a poor way. But, you know, forget all that. Back to my original point, I, uh, you know, we don't, we're not going to give out any information about any, about, we're, we're not going to give out any personal information about our website or anything like that with the people on it um, and stuff like that. But we're within legal grounds to do so. Uh, we, have, we have to play the legal game for now. So anyway, I hope that answers your question. Don't worry about it. Number 40. Most people I talk to seem to believe that the world is overpopulated and becoming more so, meaning they think it isn't and never will be enough resources. There isn't and never will be enough resources for everyone. Also, the lack of global surveying of everything from raw materials to soil nutrients, uh, which what is, what is the hard evidence making you certain that there can be abundance for all? I appreciate that our current system is designed to perpetuate scarcity, but people tend to believe scarcity is, in fact, is a fact of life, not our system. Well, that's, that's right. People do tend to believe that because that's the most profitable position for people to uh, assume for the, for the corporation. Uh, we're going to stop all waste. We're going to stop all duplicity. You're not going to have multiple organizations producing the same thing in competition. You're going to maximize food production on multiple levels. We have a ton of energy, which is supplyable. Machine fact factories of production will run 24-7 as needed. We'll also be able to monitor those to stop shortages and overruns at any level. And also remember that 70% of the earth is oceans. So population isn't that big of a deal when you understand that we can populate the oceans, we can build artificial land masses, there's plenty of things we can do. And in the end, if in long periods of time, if we can't get the public to understand that their reproductive uh, actions have consequences, and we run out of space and resources, which I think we have a very long way ahead of us if this system is put into place, our current system will run out much faster, um, then all energy would be mobilized to get off of the planet and to to work in the larger order of the universe, which is not a fanciful notion, it will be the next level. And you could terraform other planets, you could build gigantic space stations the size of states through nanotechnology. There's plenty of options out there if you put your mind to it. So the whole issue is within a restricted frame of reference. And back to the central point, no. We have the resources, and population growth as it is today is not a threat once we understand that we can feed everybody many, many times over. We have the energy to do so to support all the facilities and energy requirements many, many times over. And as far as land and space, well, we can move upwards and we can also move into the oceans. So number 41, I'm running out of time here. 
a resource you failed to mention is the human resource. Even if you completely eliminate the scarcity of material resources, the scarcity of individuals remains an issue. Each person is fundamentally unique. In the case of the Venus Project, the material resources are limited, but limitless, but the human capacity to reproduce is not. Thus, the males driven by testosterone will compete for access to women. Although the Venus Project claims that there will be no leadership, the male competition will invariably cause a hierarchy to emerge. The men who are successful in competition rise to the top of the hierarchy and will have more access to women. The competition among young males over mating partners will invariably lead to violence, and without any law or police to intervene, the emergent hierarchy will undermine the ideals of the Venus Project, ultimately bringing about its collapse or usurpation. Well, that's a handful of uh, declaratory statements, and I'll say very quickly, first of all, human hierarchy is complex and multi-angled. For example, a person with low socioeconomic sta status and hence low in the social hierarchy based on income and power might be, in turn, the world's greatest mathematician, who is at the top of an intellectual hierarchy detached from the socioeconomic one. In the hierarchy example you were using, sexual hierarchy, you were leaving out the motivation, uh, the motivating component, which is scarcity. In the ra if the ratio of women to men was, say, 2 to 10 in today's society, then yes, you would see some very bizarre dominant moves by men to obtain the scarce women. Uh, of course, this isn't the case, and there's no reason to assume that women or men will suddenly become scarce. Um, if it did, the hierarchy might be created, but it would be only relevant to, uh, to sexual reproduction, and that's it. And also, the, the central point here is we're not slaves to the hormone. We're not biological machines. We're not. There's a huge spectrum of behavior that's changed as complex organisms uh, excuse me, simplified organisms become complex organisms. It sounds like you're, you're operating out of a strictly uh, biological perspective. You're not giving any any notion to the fact that that um, we're dramatically influenced by culture. Our values are very powerful and can override our biological urges, and very often they do. If they didn't, you'd have men running around society just raping women left and right, and it would be a social norm. Uh, so I hope that makes sense. It's a, it's a, a series of dramatic statements you're making. There's the emergent hierarchy would not would not happen based on what you're describing. It's also important to point out that hierarchy is also not a continual staple staple of human history. Hunters and gatherers, um, as we know about uh, historically through uh, uh, common day bushmen that live in say Africa, they don't really have social hierarchy at all, which is fascinating from a from an anthropological standpoint. Um, it's really interesting to point that out. In fact, there was a book written. That talked about the original affluent society. They talked about how advanced the hunter and gatherer societies are, were, and uh, a lot of people argue that I've read in certain science texts that, in fact, the agricultural age is what has created the hierarchy that we see today. That is the socioeconomic hierarchy, the hierarchy based on resource domination and selling for profit. It's because at that point it became it became restricted and strategized. And then global in the sense that, in the sense that it was more advanced, and certain distributions, certain, certain distributions became, excuse me, certain necessities became, uh, certain items became necessities in other regions, and suddenly trade emerged. Hunters and gatherers didn't have that. It was a much more simplistic, detached society, um, generally speaking. So I'm running out of time. I only have about uh, 10 seconds left or 30 seconds left. There's a lot more I could say about that quote. But uh, generally, you're, you're overreaching with this to assume we're just simply biological machines, and we're not. And the hierarchy would only that you quote quote would only be relevant to would only be relevant to uh, to sexuality, and that's it. Uh, human society is hierarchical in a spectrum of ways. The most dominant, of course, is socioeconomic. Once you remove that socioeconomic hierarchy, a lot of the patterns of of you know type anus and a lot of this stuff that exists today, I, I believe, will eventually slowly fade away, and you'll have a, a new culture that, that isn't about dominance and power and usurpation and alpha and stuff like that. While there are biological elements to the behavior of people through testosterone, through adrenaline, it is not uh, the only element that ga gauges people's behavior. We can override those tendencies, and we can create environments that don't allow capitulation of those tendencies as well. So I'm running out of time. I uh, apologize for my rambling and slightly distracted nature today. I'm fortunately very very exhausted, but uh, I really appreciate everybody listening. I will talk to you all very, very soon. Have a good uh, two weeks, and I'll be in London. You'll hear about all that as it develops.